Verbally Effective with Ina Esco is an interview style podcast that intersects art, culture, politics, and entertainment with a Memphis focus. Each week, I'm joined by a featured guest with roots in Memphis. Verbally Effective delves into each guest's personal journey to uncover the incredible stories fueling their purpose, the highs and lows of their pursuits, and how through their passion, they are moving the culture forward. What's good? It's Big Sue, and I'm hanging out with my girl, Ina Esco. We're going to chop it up about everything. You hear me? Everything on the Verbally Effective Podcast. What's up? It's your girl, Devin Dion. The life of the party always get it started, and you already know I'm rocking with the Verbally Effective Podcast and Ina Esco. Hey, it's your double E, Ina Esco, hanging out with you guys once again for another live edition of the Verbally Effective Podcast right here at WYXR 91.7 FM, Memphis, raised by sound. And I have a lovely lady in the building (laughs) with me. Oh, my. Her resume is just you guys are about to hear about it right now. She is currently the CEO and founder of The Big We. We're going to talk all about that. She is a culture strategist, a producer, writer, entrepreneur, philanthropist. What else do you do? (laughs) Anasa Troutman. How are you, beautiful? I just want to (laughs) say. You are already getting this. I'm like, that was a spectacular intro. You like that intro? I mean, not even when you were talking about me, just when you were like, it's your double E. I'm like, you know what? You know what you're doing. Oh, girl, I've been doing you this about 24 years mm, in this tell. thing. I can tell. Yes, but okay. <laughs> uh, gr- uh, working with some uh, big hitters in the music game. So like yeah. when I was reviewing your resume, mm-hmm. I mean, everything sticks out, but when I saw you produced with India Irie, yeah, I was like, "Wow!" That was like my f- that was my first career was in the music industry. I started a record label when I was twenty three, because you know what I learned in my old age. <laughs> what you learn in your old <laughs> most age? Most of the most important things I've ever done, I did because I got mad and I was like, "You know what? I'm about to." And that was one of those things. I was like. Wow, the world really sucks. What can I do? Yeah, I know all these brilliant musicians who do this heartwarming, love transforming music. I'm going to start a record label. Let's go. Wow. And I had no business doing that. At I had 23. no business. Mm-hmm. And you know, the uh, mm-hmm. music industry is so cutthroat. So. It's awful. Yes, it's, it's literally is. the worst <laughs> place in all of America. Yeah. It I mean, is it's violent, it's dangerous, it's. Which is why I ended up leaving because all the things, all the reasons why I got into it, there were not a lot of people who were also there for the same reason. And I'm like, no shade to them at all. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe a little bit of shade, but maybe it just bit. wasn't our my my destiny wasn't aligned with the set of values and practices that are alive and well in the music industry. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I can't, I can't actually get there from here. I can't actually be a transformative force for loving community and all those things that I believe in Mm. inside of that infrastructure. It's just not built for it. There were things that it was built for and those things, you know, happened and worked and I was able to learn from them and take some of those lessons into my current work. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, especially for for a woman, a woman and a a black woman black women and i know it's like cliche to be like black women but like for real black women are not safe in the music industry yeah it's just it's just not you 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 either are unsafe or you have to become something outside of yourself to be able to maintain your safety and a level of bravado that allows you to pretend that you're safe Mm -hmm. but it's 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 not um it's i'm not built for it wow you know well, since you kind of hit the game in the music industry, <laughs> what do you think about today's music, today's R&B specifically? Oh, why would you ask me that in public? Well, um, Anasa, what me, are you listening to in your ride? Uh, oh, um, well, yesterday I had Black Parade on repeat literally for the whole day okay. from my morning to my night. Um, I mean, just like everybody else, I've been listening to renaissance for the past year yes i mean almost nothing classic else. i mean instant classic mm-hmm. instant classic um but i listen to <laughs> I, listen, <laughs> I listen to a lot of um music from the past mm-hmm. i listen to a lot of instrumental music i have one of my favorite pandora station is est music which is like a a jazz piano trio mm-hmm. and so you hear all kind of eric reed and you know yes all the all the 
all the newer piano greats. I just love jazz piano. It's one of my favorite things. Okay. Um, I listen to um, Afrobeat a lot. I love Afrobeat. <laughs> I do too. Yes. I love it so I'm glad much. we're hearing more of it. Yes. I'm loving how Afrobeat is coming into like, I wouldn't say it's in the mainstream, but it's like really seeping into other mm-hmm. kinds of music. It's making me super happy. Yes. Um, You'll notice them getting uh, nominations in a lot of uh, award show categories. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. I listen to, I'm trying, trying to think about, I have a lot of playlists. I'm a playlist maker. Mm-hmm. I have been since I was a very small person Mm -hmm. I've been making playlists like since before they were electronic playlists like literally like on cassette tapes I was making playlists I used to have these little folders I would make my playlist and then I would write down the list of the songs and I would listen to every song a thousand times and write down lyrics to every song and every tape had a a lyric book connected to it in my Mm -hmm. little box okay so I'm like I'm that person yes you've been with it so I'm not like (laughs) I'm not necessarily gonna be like I listen to this all the time but I will go to my I have a playlist called All Day. I have a playlist called Beach. I have a playlist called, mm. like, I have all these different playlists to yeah. give me different energies, mm. depending on how I'm feeling in the moment. Yeah. And I also listen to a lot of audiobooks. <laughs> hey, we love a good audiobook. I had a, I had a moment where I couldn't listen to music um, when I was kind of coming out of the music industry the last time, because I've, I've been in the industry twice. I was in there for 10 years, and I quit, and then I was back for... Six years and I, the last time I quit, I was like, I can't. You I had can't to go back and listen. get another dose. I didn't mean it, child. I was supposed to do it for it. six months and I was in there for six years. And I was like, <laughs> what have I done? But I mean, but I, you know. Yeah, it's this, a very tempting industry. Well, it is. It's, I mean, if, if I tell you about some of the experiences I had both times, they're like once in a lifetime mm-hmm. dream like. Things. I've been on tour with Stevie Wonder. I've been on tour with Sade. I've been on a boat with Oprah. Sade. I've been like, I've been, Let's stop it, Sade. you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. I've had these like once in a lifetime experiences where looking from the outside, it would seem like I have like the most amazing, wonderful life. But from the inside, it felt very mediocre. Mm. And I'm not saying there weren't moments like there's nothing like being on tour with Stevie Wonder. There's I nothing. I, there's nothing that Legendary. I've ever done that would ever that will that will never be topped. Like watching him every night for four months mm. perform my favorite album that ever was made, singing, dancing, crying every night as much as the first night for the, to the last night. Like mm-hmm. I will never do anything that will top that. Mm-hmm. And also, when you are living a life that doesn't feel like your authentic life and you're not able to express all of your innate brilliance and all of your ideas and all of the things that you know that you're born to do, even the most spectacular moment feels like mediocrity. Mm, that's deep. And so it was not a life that, it was a life that was meant to prepare me for the things I'm doing now and the things I'll do in the future, but it was not the life that I was supposed to sustain forever gotcha. right and the the, <laughs> the trick is knowing that because mm-hmm. i think i feel like a lot of people are like you're supposed to be here for this moment to learn this to get this to meet these people to do whatever mm-hmm. to get your tools up so you can live your destiny and people get stuck they get stuck because they get they get stuck in the like because it's, it's comfortable <laughs> very comfortable <laughs> it's comfortable and it feels cushy and it feels like mm, people people look at me different when I'm in this room. People give me different things. I have access to different things. I was on a boat with Oprah. Like you get like who, the you know what I'm saying? Yes. Right. But, and also it never, I never felt free. Mm, yeah. And so my freedom was more important to me than my comfort. Yeah. And so I had to figure out how to get free. I got you, Anasa. I mean, that's all a part of the journey. Ciao. <laughs> all a part of the journey. I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm way more free than I used to be, but I'm still like, yeah. It sounds you like know? you made a lot of great connections, though. I mean, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anasa, yes. Anasa, where are you originally from? Are you originally from Memphis? No. Where well, are you originally I feel like from? My soul is from Memphis, but I actually was born in Harlem. Okay, Harlem. Mm-hmm. Well, I was born in Manhattan, but my first apartment was in Harlem on 135th and Lenox. Okay. In a building called Lenox Terrace. Mm. Um, I lived there for a couple years, and then my, we moved to um, 
to Orange, New Jersey, because my parents went to school. My parents went back to school at the same time. My mom went to law school. My dad went to medical school. Wow. And so we lived there for four years, obviously, because they were in school. And then we moved to Charleston, South Carolina. I love Charleston. It's, it's my beautiful. favorite. It's so wonderful. It is gorgeous. It's, it was a wonderful place to be as a child. Mm -hmm. It was, um, this, you know, it's interesting. I just had a thought I never had before. I... I'm wondering in this moment, um, because my parents had a very, very, very close knit circle of friends when I was born and we moved to New Jersey and it was, you know, they're still there, but we're far away, far ish mm -hmm. away. And my parents are in school. So like mm -hmm. they're not, we're not with those folks as much, but like moving to Charleston, they replicated that community in such mm. a way that I felt really at home and I felt really seen and I felt really safe. And I, I, I loved being in the South. Mm -hmm. I loved it so much. It's a lot of history in Charleston. It, girl, these people used to take us to the plantation for field trips. I bet I they like, did. Why are we, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, to why? learn your history. Why are you, oh, I don't know if that's why we were there. <laughs> <laughs> if they had had the oh, right conversation, God. I would agree. Okay. But um, the conversation we would have at home was different than the one that they we were I'm, having when we were touring the plantation. Mama and Daddy you know knew what, what to say. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, that was a crazy aside. Anyway, um, and then we moved back to Jersey, and then I moved. I went to Spelman, so I was in Atlanta. How was for Spelman? A long time. Yikes. Another question you should not have asked me in public. Listen. We have to talk okay, about listen. it, Anasa. All girls. Okay. Oh yeah, that's that was fine. I mean, that it was, was like fine. technically all girls, but like yeah, we're at Morehouse half the time. I mean, out. Morehouse and Clark and, and Clark, Morris yes. Brown, and also Georgia Tech and Georgia State, and like it. It's and it's, lot, you're in yeah. Atlanta. Atlanta. You leave. You don't even. You leave your dorm room, and it's a dude standing there. Like it's. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! I think at the time at on the AUC, at the time, I believe that the ratio was like something like six to one mm. um, um, men, cisgender men to cisgender women. And so it, there was a little bit of a, you know, disparate situation, but like dudes everywhere. Dudes everywhere. That wasn't, that wasn't the issue. The real issue was, I mean, really the same thing that happened to me everywhere as I go into a space building, like, of course, everyone in here is going to want to love everybody and we're going to be so happy and we're going to be liberated and free. Mm. And people just ain't like that. Yeah. And it was a, my first real, like, experience of classism yeah. and hate for poor people and disregard and disrespect for poor people. Mm. And, like, to be completely, completely honest with you, the AUC had a caste system. Mm. It was like Spelman and Morehouse are on this level, Clark is on this level, Morris Brown is on this level, and then everybody else is under that. Mm. And it was real. I don't I don't know that it's still like that today. I could I have friends that teach there and all that I could ask. But when I was a student, it was a very clear and articulated caste system. And because I was a Spelman woman, there were um, suggestions about who I should m mingle with, who I should interact with, who I should date, who I should mm. stay away from, where I should walk, where I should, you know. And it just was a, it was a surprise. It was yeah. a surprise and it was a, a little bit devastating, to be honest. Did you complete um, your education mm -hmm. at Spelman? What but was I your never, major? Biology. Okay. <laughs> Excuse my point. Why did I start a record label? I was a biology major. Why did it I do happens. that? Why did that happen? I had no business. But I also like very much um, recoiled from social life at Spelman in the AUC, which is really how I ended up in the music space because I would just go to class and go home. Like I didn't ha have a lot of friends on campus. I didn't join any of the little things, the, you know, the clubs and stuff. Yeah. I was talking the other day to someone. I was like, I don't, my poor Morehouse brother, I don't even know who he is. Like he never saw my face. I never showed up to the little event because I was mm. like, these are not my people. Yeah. And I found myself because I've started working at a record store. I found myself in this community of artists and I was like ah oh, there we go it was the record These are my store people. it was a record store mm. as Prince would say the record store so I built my community there amongst musicians and painters and writers and artists and people who are like exploring their own imagination and exploring the possibility of the world through the lens of their imagination now those were the people who I felt like oh, okay yes. <laughs> I, here I am safe 
Yeah. Here I can explore. Here I can figure out who I am and how I want to show up in the world. And that I guess that's why I, why I planted my flag in the artistic space because I felt powerful. Yeah, I felt seen. I felt like myself. Yes, you know? it feels good to you know feel that way. It does because you don't often feel that way in certain Cheryl, spaces. I sure that Spelman. And you know, my sister went to Spelman, and she had the complete opposite experience. Like she mm-hmm. loved Spelman's Dirty Draws, and I loved that she loved it. <laughs> right? I have other friends who were in school with me who who like whole, love it, revere it, and, and I understand the power and the beauty. And the brilliance of a Spellman in a Morehouse, and I understand, right? It just wasn't it. It wasn't um, the most comfortable time in my life. But also, if if I was there now or ten years ago, like if I had gone at a different point in my life, it also would have been a different experience yeah. because I was very shy, very insecure, very unsure of myself. Like I didn't know how to express myself in healthy ways i didn't know how to i was like the most codependent person on planet earth and so Mm -hmm. now i would walk into a situation right like that and i would say something different and i would transform the space that i was in yeah but i let the space transform me and 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 cause me to leave and like to to withdraw into myself to be able to find another way But, um, so like, I don't want to act like it was just a terrible place because it's not a terrible place. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot there. It's a beautiful space. We, you know, the the president at the time was like one of the most powerful women on the planet. And so I don't want to paint this awful picture of it. And also it was a hard time and I was not equipped to, to be able to understand, deal with, or transform it into something that was going to be. That where I could be powerful and I could actually powerful be f- powerful for this space. Because mm-hmm. now what I've learned is that I can walk into a room and I can make it something else. Yes. And I can help people um, heal in healthy ways. Mm-hmm. And I can help people see the things that they cannot see. But I didn't know that at the time. You didn't know that. Um, hey, it, it takes us going through different experiences. That's Child. why you can, that's why you can tell these stories and pull these stories out yeah, of people. I got a lot of, of stories. <laughs> I see. I, I got see. those. I got those. Do you ever go back to Spelman homecoming? I don't go back to or? Atlanta. You don't go Atlanta back to Atlanta. Atlanta is just not my boo. Okay. At, like, at, like, I remember <laughs> When my parents dropped me off at school, I remember getting off the highway and being like, what have I done? I literally said out loud, looking out the window, what have I done? Mm. Because I was like, oh, I don't actually like this place. I don't like this city. So I don't go to Atlanta. So you stay away? I mean, I just don't go. I don't like stay stay away. I'm not like that. Mm -hmm. I just don't go. It's not, I've traveled too much already. Mm -hmm. I love to be at home. I love to be in Memphis. And so if I don't have to, if I'm going away for like pleasure, it's not going to be to Atlanta. Right. Mm-mm. How did you get to Memphis? Oh, my favorite. <laughs> um, well, I feel like my first time, I mean, I've been here many times on tour, which, you know, that doesn't count because you just get off the bus and go into the hotel. You don't re- really get the experience. And actually, we have been here even more times because India's grandparents are from here. Wow. India's mom, her matrilineal line is from Memphis. Mm. And so... Um, I had, you know, all those experiences. But then when I left the music industry the second time and I had this girls program and I was like, I want to work with girls because I, I wanted to build a program that I needed when I was a girl. And so I met this dude at a party. We had a launch party for the girls program in Martha's Vineyard. And this man, like I was at the grocery store trying to buy supplies for the party. And he was like, he pulled up and he was like, I know who you are and I want to give you some money. Can you come to Memphis next week? Okay. I was like, I sure can. Because at the time I lived in Nashville. So I was like, I, I'm three hours away. I'll get in the car. I'll be right there, sir, mm-hmm. whoever you are. And it was the direct, the director of Memphis Music Initiative at the time. Wow. And so I came here and that team of people introduced me to so many amazing artists here in Memphis and they became my funder for the girl. They were like my first funder for the girls program. They funded our first pilot. We had a group of girls here. We had all these amazing events. It was amazing. And while I was here, one of the trips, somebody was like, you should go by Claiborne Temple. I think that you would really love it. And I didn't know the history of Claiborne Temple at the time. I didn't really know the history of Memphis really that tough at the time. 
So I just walked into Claiborne and it blew my mind. The building was the most beautiful space. It was like I walked in and my brain exploded and I saw colors and heard <laughs> sounds and saw people flying around. I was like, what is this place? Mm-hmm. Who are these people? Who are these ancestors in here that want to speak? Who are these people? Who are What are these stories? Like what's happening here? And the folks who were running at the time, like, welcomed me in, a stranger off the street. It was very <laughs> unsafe. Everybody held on a hard hat and some steel toe boots. And I had on, like, a dress and some <laughs> sandals. And I got to know them over a year. Mm-hmm. And eventually, um, MLK 50 was coming up. And they had decided they wanted to do a musical about the sanitation worker strike. And I was like, well, that's, that's cool. Who's producing it? And they were like, who's doing what? And I was like, you what, are. Do you, what do you mean? I'm like, who is anybody on the team have any experience in producing theater? Mm-hmm. And they said, no. And I said, do y'all have experience in producing anything? And they were like, no. And I was like, great. Everybody yeah. move over. Such a I'm coming pick. to Memphis. And so I spent like months just learning the history mm-hmm. because you know, you're writing a musical about something that really, really happened. So there's like books and articles and documentary films and all these things that you have to read to absorb the story so that you can repurpose them in a way that can be concise and entertaining and exciting for people and can fit in the space because we did it inside the Claiborne Temple. Mm. And I was really struck by a couple things. One, just like, the community that was built during the strike, not built, deepened, because the folks, the families of the sanitation workers and the and the workers were already community. They were like living in South Memphis, living in Orange Mound. They were neighbors. They were coworkers. They were church members. Right? They were people who already took care of each other. And in that moment, it became something even more precious and deep in the way that they were like, okay. Y'all go do this part. We're going to do this part. Y'all come around and do this part. And like, we're going to come together. So that was like, felt really beautiful to me. And because Mm -hmm. I was able to be in the space every day that was a container for that, it just felt really special to me. But then like understanding the last year of King's life and listening to the speech that he made on on April 4th, 1967 in New York City and feeling very connected to the space where he, in Riverside Church, like I said, really important. For someone who was born in New York City, that's a very important space. Mm-hmm. And so to have, to understand like that, the march that he was making from that moment to April 4th, 1968, started in the place where I was born, felt really special wow. to me. And the thing that he said, when he was like, yes, we've made a lot of progress on the racial front, but like if we're not thinking about race and class and militarism then we're not going to be free also felt very very true because remember my experience at Spelman was like I thought it was going to be all these amazing black people doing these amazing liberatory work and they were too busy being classist so I'm mm-hmm. like wow yeah we could we could be a room full of black people and still be on some BS because we can't see yeah. hu- our humanity past the fact that you don't have the same thing that I have right yeah. and so it felt very like okay, that's a thesis for my, like this speech is a thesis for my life, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And at the time I had been like, just coming off of some work with Harry Belafonte, working in cross-racial uh, organizations with like poor white folks, Latinx folks, indigenous folks, and black people. So like that, all, see, it was just all these things yes. about my life and my experience and my work were wrapped up in this one speech that led to this amazing cataclysmic transformative moment of King being murdered around the corner from Claiborne Temple after working with the folks who had been organizing and galvanizing and building community there. Oh, wow. And then on top of that, on top of that, on top of that, I had heard the story of a young man who was 16 named Larry Payne who was murdered on March 28, 1968 after the first March where that all went all crazy and it, we were like in a in the middle of a of um 
of a national conversation around gun violence and police and young black men being murdered by the police. And it was like, damn, this is the same, like, this is the same yeah. story. So there's like the race thing, which is the obvious. Then there's the class conversation. And then there's this, this over militarization of the police at, uh, and black men dying at the hand of that system. And all of that is wrapped up in King's speech. It's like, that's exactly mm-hmm. what he's saying. So that moment in 2018 was like, uh, Oh, we we right we're right here. We're sitting in the bosom of this speech right here in this historic moment. And then on top of that, on top of that. I read an article called Memphis Burning mm-hmm. about the legacy of Robert Church and I was like, "What?" Whoa. <laughs> what? Okay. What? And I said, "Oh my god, this is actually not about restoring the legacy of the sanitation workers or of King. This is about going all the way back and restoring the legacy of Robert Church. Mm. And I remember reading that article and I I put the paper down and said out loud, I'm moving to Memphis. I guess I'm not leaving because it yeah. felt like it felt like the entire history of black America in one square block. Yeah. It felt like the entire story of my entire ancestral legacy in a period, in a space, in a story, in a building. And I felt like there was transformation available for all of us in this moment. And I wanted to be a part of it. And this place, this city, in addition to having like such incredibly deep roots and such incredible history when you look backwards, when you look forwards, there's this like deep well of imagination and creativity and ingenuity in black Memphis. And I'm like, that's our salvation right there. It's happening. That's it. Like yeah. where, why would I leave here? Yes. <laughs> where am I going yes. back to Nashville? Absolutely not. I'm not it's going anywhere. Memphis. I'm it's not going anywhere. And this to me is like such an important city such an important story, such an important catalyst for the future Mm -hmm. through the lens of the past, obviously. And it just felt, I felt good here. I felt alive here and I felt like I could learn about who I am and who I wanted to become in this city. And so I just didn't leave. That's so beautiful, Anasa. This place is so beautiful. Yes, it is. I love this place so much. Yes. I love it so much. It used to make me so sad when I first moved here because I was like, well, all these people are just walking around. They don't even know what they got. <laughs> y'all, why are y'all talking so bad about my boo? Like, why are y'all okay. talking about Memphis like that? So you see it through another lens. Than yes, I see some it others. through a different lens. And I understand, the, I understand <clears throat> like what it is for me to come from the life I have had and, and see what I see here. And I understand like the amount of grief that this city holds not just for the city, but for the world. And to think about um, the death of Echo and Cole, uh, Echo Cole and, and Robert Walker in, in the back of a truck, uh, back of a garbage truck, and then all that they, that whole community endured during the strike, and then to have Larry Payne murdered and have his funeral at Claiborne, and then to have King murdered, mm-hmm. like all in two months. It's like, you know, when, have you ever been to the beach? And like you get knocked down by a wave and you try to get up but the next mm-hmm. one comes before you can get up and you just be like bump it and you just lay down yes <laughs> that's what memphis feels like to me wow. it's like the sorrow of all the things of being the capital of cotton of having robert church's legacy destroyed of the sanitation workers who were killed in the truck of king of all those things it was just mm-hmm. like how do you expect somebody to not feel sorrow Mm-hmm. How do you expect someone to not feel shame when you keep telling them like you you basically suck, you're basically the worst in the country, you're basically this, that, and the other? But it's not. It's just not true. It's just not true what people say about Memphis. Yeah. Like the the facts are true. Like the things, the numbers, and the the, the what do you call it? The stats mm-hmm. might be true, but the truth is so much more than that. Yeah, there are layers, there are layers. There are layers to this, and I just (laughs) want it, like, I want people to, I want people who are from this place to to see it through my eyes. Yeah. Just for a minute. Like, you don't have to take all my stuff, but, like, just see it just for a minute through my eyes and then go back to your story and be like, well, maybe I can reconsider, and maybe there's more I can do, maybe a different approach I can take to be able to help make the city 
shine in the way that it wants to and it deserves to. Yes. Well, that's why we have Anasa Traubman with the big we. We're going to get <laughs> all into the storytelling aspect. Yes. And uh, some more amazing work that you have. We're going to hear from our community partners real quick. Mm -hmm. But we will be right back with the amazing Anasa Troutman. I'm all right. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, hey, it's Ina Esco back right here on WYXR 91.7 FM Memphis. Raised by sound. I am in the building for a live verbally effective podcast with the amazing, like I said before the break, the amazing (laughs) Anasa Troutman, the CEO and founder of the big we and she's a master at storytelling because I've been sitting here listening to her tell me quite a few stories and I want to say that is how the big we came all together so let's talk about the big we how did you come up with the name and tell (laughs) me the mission of the big we oh that's what I actually can tell you that so (laughs) the big we um actually started off as a podcast okay I have always had my own production company. Again, I've been I've been producing since I, was, since I was 19. So I've always maintained like my own entity, even when I was touring or with India or wherever. I always was like wanted a space to do other things. Um, and I had a partnership with an organization called the Movement Strategy Center in Oakland with some very, very, very dear friends of mine. And we were like sitting around thinking about how we can make reparations irresistible. Like, how do we make Mm. reparations sexy? How do we have a national public conversation? Because it was, you know, for all the reasons that you are, you know. And we were like, what can we afford to do inside this organization? It was like, podcast is a very low bar. Like, that's something that we we like to talk. We like to talk to each other. We're fun. And right on in. and And then the production bar is low. So, like, in an organization that doesn't have a practice around production and producing like this is something that we can introduce into the space where they will say yes they will give us the money and they will be able to they will be able to jump the curve around the learning curve to be able to do the podcast so we were like sitting around (laughs) in a room and somebody was like how we need to be able to talk to the bigger we we can't just talk to our own people and i was like well we just don't call it the big we and they were like oh (laughs) So in the middle of the woods in Michigan, we decided to call it the Big We. And the conversations were like so beautiful. And it was also like a really, a moment of awakening for me to be able just to have a microphone in my face and just say whatever I want. I had never done that before. I'd always supported other people in doing that. So like being able to free my own voice in that way felt really very powerful. Yes. And, um... At some point, the organization was like, well, that was cute. We loved we loved it, but we're going to move on. And I was like, give give it to me. Mm. I want it because it felt it was it was um, very uh, powerful for me, both personally and professionally, to be able to have um, a mechanism like that that was carrying my own voice and my own ideas. Because, I, again, that's not something that was normal for me at the time. And I asked I was like, just give it to me. I named it. Give it to me. And they were like, OK. So they signed all the IP over to me. And I was like, this is the brand that I want to hold. This is the brand I want to I want to carry all of my things. This is the basket I want to put all of my stuff in. Because the brand, I had never experienced something that felt so true. Because if you know anything about me, then you know that the, the thing that I'm most committed to is exuding and embodying love on the planet Earth. Okay. Or if I go to another planet, I'll do it there too. But like right now, <laughs> it's Earth. And I actually want to build a big we. That's like my actual life's mission is to be able to be in community with people and have us grow that community such that other people can grow and feel a sense of belonging also. Mm-hmm. And not just black people, not just women, like literally any person from any background who wants to feel and share love are welcome into the space. We absolutely center black women, Southern black women in particular, because of all the reasons I don't have to explain to you, but it's a space for everyone. And I believe that every, that we all need healing at the most egregious, whatever to the most, whatever, like we all need healing and we all need love. We all want to be seen and, and regarded as precious, right? This Mm -hmm. is like a human compulsion to want to be connected to someone else or something else. And, I changed my my um, production company name to The Big We, and then eventually 
Um, I took over Claiborne Temple and ended up purchasing from purchasing it from those folks who, who were holding it. Wow. Um, in 2019, and that became a part of the conversation. Mm. And um, and then like <laughs> at the, right before the pandemic, I had a dream that I needed to raise a bunch of money and give it away. And I, it was because of the way that the way that I acquired Claiborne and the difficulty I had acquiring Claiborne. I can imagine. Taught me that there were not enough people stewarding philanthropic and investment dollars who were actually connected to and committed to black people. Yeah. Particularly in Memphis, right? Yes, it's and a that lot does of that. not, and I, I'm not, I'm not um, saying that there are not lots of people who want to be transformative and com- and committed to black communities, but it requires something that they don't have access to, mm-hmm. and they're not willing to do the work to have access to. And in some cases, it's not possible for them to ha- have access to it, right? Through no fault of their own, it's just about proximity and distance and in life experience. And so I had a dream, and my dream was like, you got to you gotta pull money together so that you can change the face of philanthropy in Memphis at least. You, you gave it away. I mean, I haven't raised everything, but, okay. I've, I, but we have raised probably between the construction at Claiborne. So we've built a foundation in 2020 during the pandemic. After I had that dream, I was like, okay, great. I need, I need to have a foundation so I can raise money and figure out what to do. So between the foundation and the production company and the in Claiborne, probably probably raised ten million dollars in the past three oh, years. Oh, that's a ni- that's a that's a nice number. And all the money has either gone into staff, obviously, because we have an amazing team that does amazing things, and I can't do anything without them. Nothing like I'm like y'all think I'm out here doing stuff. I'm not really doing nothing. It's, it's really other all people. them for like for, for real though, people. for real. And then, um, and then the restoration of Claiborne, that's been obviously quite expensive. And then we give out grants and we do programming. So we just had our second round of women's storytelling grants. We've given away 100 grand to four women's storytellers. I guess it's 120 grand. And we've done that twice. We're doing it another time. We have a girls program. She like that same girls program that brought me to Memphis. Mm -hmm. We still have that program. We still support those girls. We have a cohort of black entrepreneurs here, uh, creative entrepreneurs here in Memphis. We have a cohort in Mobile. Like we're, we're doing a lot of things to really rethink this conversation at the intersection of culture and the economy. Yes. Like how do our stories inform us and transform us so that we can participate in the economy in a different way? And instead of thinking about like community benefit, not, I'm not saying community benefit is bad, but instead of like, can we think beyond community benefit and think about community ownership and governance? Mm. It's a different conversation. If I'm like, hey girl, how can my store help you? As opposed to, hey girl, do you want to own this store? That's two different conversations. Totally. Two different conversations. It's two conversations. different conversations. If you really want to transform the future, you can't just be like, how do I benefit you? Mm-hmm. You have to say, I would like to offer this to you so you can figure out how you can benefit yourself and your community. You can have agency. You can have sovereignty. You can have the opportunity to build wealth. And, and I don't mean wealth in like the hyper-capitalist context. I don't mean like... I want you to build wealth so that you get to be excellent and you get to be the millionaire in your community and everybody else has to figure it out. I want to say, like, how do I help you build wealth in a way that your whole community is safe and can experience their own abundance and can feel joy and love all the time? I love it. Because that is the opportunity of a new economy in the future. It is. Right? Like, I don't care. I don't need... I don't need to be like a billionaire. <laughs> like, do you need a billion dollars or can you have 400 million and we can figure out what to do with the rest of this so other b- people can feel safe and joyful? Like, yeah. do you need two billion? Do you need a <laughs> hundred billion? Want to be fine. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> or can we think, can we rethink the way that we have structured our systems Mm -hmm. so that other people, everybody, so that everyone can experience it because the economy is like, back to King's point, economics is the one lever that you can pull that will literally affect every system from education to healthcare to agriculture and food systems to Radio is like literally everything. That's right. Literally everything. And our 
systems were constructed based on the idea that some people were deserving and some people were not. And so we have to like rethink the very foundation of our economic structures to say like, actually, what if we built an economic system that was built on the notion that we are all deserving of safety, love, joy, and abundance? And what would we do then? At that point, we would be like, well, if we believe that every child experience was, uh, was, should experience safety, joy, and love, and abundance, then we would change the entire way that we fund public school systems. Mm. The entire way we would have to be like, wow, this is real effed up the way we fund schools. If we believe that every child should experience safety, joy, love, and abundance, we got to rethink this right now. Yeah. If we believe that everybody should have access to health care, we got to rethink the whole thing from the economics on down right now. But we don't really believe that. Anasa, let me ask you a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you have these conversations yeah. with people, yeah. um, you know, talking about ownership, talking about agency, what is usually the first response? Are they game or are they like, <laughs> I it can depends do on that? who I'm talking to. Okay. I get one of three responses. Okay. I either get like the face and the sounds of awe and wonder, like, whoa, I never thought, I never even, that never even occurred to me that that was a thing. I either get that, or I get people who are like, hell yeah, let's go. Or I get people who literally like this, more than one person has said this to me, like more than three people have said this to me. I'm not sure what you're talking about. I really enjoy capitalism. What? Girl. <laughs> for real. Like, for mm. real. And I often have to say, I'm sure you do. Some mindset. Right? And I also get the people who are like, wow, that sounds amazing, but I don't know if that's possible. Mm-hmm. Which is a fair answer. It's a fair answer. Yeah. Um, so it depends, on, it depends on people's social location and their appetite for imagination, honestly. Yes. That's what it depends on. I love the fact that you're doing it right here in Memphis. Um, I don't think there's any other place. Yeah. Like, for this real. This is amazing what you're doing. <laughs> for, I mean, I would also like to say, like, I am making an honest attempt. You know, like, we're, we're, yeah. we're making progress. We're learning things. We're, our, we're transforming ourselves. We're opening our community up to, to new people. We are not close to, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, <laughs> there is... <laughs> We're working on something right now that if we, if we pull it off, we're going to be way closer than we are right now. But I, I don't want to um, project this image that like we have all the answers and we have all the money and we have all the people and we're just it's just a matter of time. We need a lot more folks to opt in to this idea that we can be different and yeah. that we can be actually democratic and that we can actually be in loving, beloved community with each other. Because even though um, from a, our collective in Memphis, religion will tell you that there is love here and that there is community here and there's connection and that people are taking care of each other. The reality is that people are making sure that babies have coats and school lunch and that's about it. That's about it. Right. And thank God for the lunches and the coats. I'm not hating on the lunches and the coats, but I'm interested in the conversation that says, like, how do we make sure that these babies got their own coats and mm-hmm. we don't got to buy them every year? We don't have to give out turkeys. We don't have to do after. Like, we don't. How do we get to the point where that's not a real conversation where everybody is taken care of and um, and 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 loved? Like, is that I don't yeah. think that's so much. to. I don't <clears throat> think that's a lot to ask. But we don't have a government or systems or banking processes that are actually built in a culture of love. We have them that are built in the culture of greed greed yeah. and scarcity to be complete. That's why I talk so much about abundance because <laughs> so much so many of our systems are built in a context of scarcity that says to everybody, there's gonna be a few people who are good and everybody else is screwed. Yeah. That's just like the reality of our cultural context all over the country. And I dare say in most parts of the world, because hypercapitalism and white supremacy are have been exported into all the corners of the earth. <laughs> so it's like hard to find a place where that's not the conversation. Yeah. And this big project that you're working on, yes, I think ma'am. you're going to pull it off. I think so, too. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> 
going to happen, Anasa. We are manifesting this beautiful thing right now. And let the verbally effective audience know how they can get in tune with, you know, using their voice, Mm. uh, being a part of the big we. Um, this amazing uh, grant funding situation that you have going on. Talk to the good people about it. I love that question. Well, um, first, I want to I want to clarify that for folks that the Big We is many things. Um, we are Historic Claiborne Temple. We are Big We Production Company. We are Big We Foundation, and we're growing into a few other entities before the end of the year and into next year too. So we are really an ecosystem of um, of organizations who are bringing forth the collective kind of response to the complexity of the situation that we find ourselves in as humans. And our whole point, our whole purpose is to be and build beloved community. That is our whole collective purpose is how do we find the spaces to be able to find ways to connect and grow and sustain and become the future version of ourselves where we are more loving and we are more compassionate and we are more, we have a place, a sense of belonging, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so there's a lot of ways that people can get involved. You can go to Claiborne.com and you can be a part of our Amal event. We have a giant puppet coming to Memphis on the 4th. You can okay. come and be a part, come into our, come and see our, um, our traveling exhibit. You can, there's so many ways you can apply to be a part of the, of the of Claiborne's cohort called the um, Community Leadership Council, where we're going through a nine month process to teach everyday Memphians about restorative economics and how to par- participate in the shift in the economy here. So there's like a million ways at Claiborne, mm-hmm. or you can go to the foundation website. You can go to to um, Big We the Big We dot com, and you mm-hmm. can learn about the grants. You can learn about the girls program. You can go to the Shoe Electricity page, and you can figure out how to enroll your your daughter or your sister or your niece or whoever mm-hmm. you're taking care of. That's a girl or a femme identified child, and put them in the Shoe Electricity cohort. You can listen to our podcast. You can yes. listen. <laughs> you yes. can listen to the Big We. We just launched a new um, season literally today, this really? morning. Really. What is the five. first? What's the first episode? The about? first episode is called "They Clone Tyrone." So Ooh. we our our podcast is really like a lens, a look at pop culture through the lens of Black imagination. Mm-hmm. So we talk about every week the different things that we feel like are important for people to be consuming from a media standpoint. So we talk about films and books and mm-hmm. concerts and all the things. So our first episode for this season was uh, the main. Um, story is about they call him Tyrone, and, and that was a good two. movie. Well, first of all, I'm a John Boyega stan. Okay, okay, that's, that's you. My, that's that's <laughs> me all day. Boyega okay? did his thing <laughs> up in there. He always does. He yes. does not disappoint. He does not. Not he, does he doesn't not. disappoint on screen or off. Mm-hmm. Right, and of course he's a full human being, and he has flaws, and of course he whatever. But like he he be he, he be doing the things. I'm, I'm okay? not hearing you mention Jamie Fox. He was in. The I mean, he's m- Jamie he Fox like, is cool. He, I, I'm not like <laughs> 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 Jamie Fox is a very talented man, and he yes. always uh, performs, and he's a he's a triple threat, quadruple threat, all the things. So happy he's healthy, but he John Boyega is my he ain't guy. No John Boyega. Okay, so I need to give you a little background. Give me because girl, I am, feel like it's listen, a connection. No, listen, uh-huh. I am probably the biggest Star Wars nerd that you ever met. Are you? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, you I'm, not my watch. Though. I'm not oh, surprised. I'm not surprised. Look at Let that. Oh wow. Okay. So, <laughs> I, so what I just showed her is my uh, Apple Watch face, which is a picture of me and Chewbacca in a deep, warm embrace. Okay. Oh, you, you the real deal. Right. So like. John Boyega being um, the first and only really modern black character in the Star Wars universe. I've been down for him since they released the first trailer and this is the first face you see, right? Mm -hmm. It just goes from there because every time you see him more and more, like his performance in The Woman King, what? Yes. What? Yes. Come Come on. on. This man is, he's an actor. Uh, Yes, he is. And he's just a good person. He loves black people. He don't, He's unapologetically in love with black people and black culture. And mm-hmm. that, I love that about him. Yes. So I'm always going to say him first. You Jamie Foxx was for John amazing, Boyega. but I'm always going to say John first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. You That's know what, Anasa? Like, I feel like there's so much more we need to discuss uh, and talk Probably about. So. Because, you know, like I said, you, you have a lot going on. And you're trying to transform 
this Memphis community, which is much we needed. We are transforming Memphis. Yes. And it's not just me. There's so many people who are already here who are already doing this work, which is why I wanted to be a part of it. Like, and I'm trying to get on board. Memphis, you you on board. Okay, I'm on board. I'm on board. I'm on board. I'm on board. <laughs> wow but look we need a part two yes, we need a lunch two. or dinner or Let's something Come on. um but you can meet a nasa troutman this friday a at the networking event for the pie box memphis festival at bill street landing from six to nine it's going to be an intimate networking mixer anasa will be sitting on the fireside chat you can learn more about the big we claiborne temple <laughs> and all of the transformative projects that anasa troutman is working on any final words for the verbally effective audience before we depart anasa yes i want the audience to get serious about learning how to love themselves. Mm. That's the most important thing that you can do is like figure out who you are and then figure out how to be that all the time with depth and Mm. compassion and healing for your own self first. And then we can talk about what it looks like to love each other. Yes, mm-hmm. I love it. Thank you so much, Anasa. Thank you. I'm gonna see you Friday night, I honey. I can't wait either. I need an outfit. I need to go to the I store. I do too, girl. <laughs> let's go. Let's go to the store when we leave here, yeah, honey. <laughs> Big shout out to Anasa Troutman and my girl Rennie as well for hey. hooking this up today. Our favorite. And thank all of you for listening right here on the Verbally Effective Podcast. I told you guys I'm having people that are making an impact in the Memphis community as guests on this show thank you guys so much for tuning in i'll check back in with you all next week